So again, it is about a uh, deployment of LTE underground. And this is in its native form, takes about an hour. I've got half an hour, so I'm going to cut all the marketing parts out of the uh, presentation. So Mestec, we've been going five years. Uh, we've developed a underground BDA, which can also do two-way radio, as well as an LTE band. And this propagates signals many kilometers, uh, very low cost. We, uh, to be able to propagate LTE, you've got to start with an LTE solution. So you've got to have a core, you've got to have Pico cells, you've got to have e -Nope Bs. Um, we work with Challenge Networks primarily. Uh, they've been going for 17 years. They started at 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. They've done in many nations as well as basically private LTEs. In the last three years, they focused specifically on the resource sector. So again, marketing. Um, uh, health and safety, you saw it yesterday, it's a key function of what we're trying to do underground. Um, 10, 15 years ago, the amount of uh, throughput you had underground was basically a two-way radio or even just a plain old telephone. And you had very little uh, telemetry capabilities. Even so, you still made, made the most of the safety aspects. Uh, the big improvement you've got with broadband is you can do remote operations, you can have cameras, you know, you can basically do tele-remote. And also, uh, very good one today for me is fatigue and drowsiness. Um, there's also a lot of um, research going on into that field where you need broadband. So you can actually start doing body telemetries if people are falling asleep, etc. Marketing. Uh, productivity gains. Um, the biggest one is what you saw yesterday, remote bogging. And semi-autonomous and then moving towards autonomous mining. Uh, this is um, a huge application. And Max has already done a presentation for me in three paragraphs when he started. But really it is about trying to make the most of the um, bandwidth capabilities to um, improve your productivity. And the main ones there, uh, like I said, would be the remote bogging. Also, uh, big data. There's a huge amount of uh, endpoints coming on, on board now where you take data from just about everything. And it's uh, based on the bottom line. If it's done correctly, you can put I single digits onto your bottom line. I think I actually went through two there, did I? No. So why LTE? And this is a bit where I actually enjoy a lot, a lot more. Um, LTE is a global standard. It's been around and developed on for you know, 20 years, where it started at 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. L LTE is part of that. It's designed uh, for seamless handover. So where you have no broadband underground, and you will have an access point, let's say, in Wi-Fi, where you've got to really pass over, pass over, pass over. That's not a natural implementation of Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is meant for spot coverage. Uh, LTE is not as part of the standard. It's also low latency, and it's pretty much guaranteed that latency. Um, it's it's collision-free, so which means if you, if you do a network, you get 30, 40 milliseconds, you'll get 30, 40 milliseconds out of that network. Now, what that allows you to do, it allows you to, to start putting you know, additional applications on there, and um, even some extra compression for your data, uh, for your videos, etc. And you know you're going to be guaranteed your latency. It has a quality of service which is strictly enforced, and it says they're in the radio interface. What that means, you can have quality of service with Wi-Fi networks, but that's mainly the network. This is also the end client. So your endpoint also basically um, enforces that uh, quality of service. That means you can prioritize different levels of service. So if I was doing a remote miner, I wanted to turn left, I wanted to turn right, I want that to be high priority. I can guarantee that within you know, 30 milliseconds. Where for your video, you might allow a little bit less. If it jitters a little bit, you don't care as long as it gets through. So the main advantages have continued. Um, the main advantages of bulk ground is it's a lot less nodes that you need compared to Wi-Fi. Talk about that a bit further on. There's a huge ecosystem of endpoints. There's billions of devices in this world now based on mobile. And as we move forward, you know, everybody talks about IoT, uh, which in LTE basically that will be most likely category M1. That will be a battery operated little device, give you one megabit, it'll give you 20 kilometers of coverage if you need to bulk down, and it'll be a battery that will last for three years. And when that comes in, you can put that just about on everything underground. And again, security, you've got a SIM card there for authentication. So let's get to the case study. I'm just about on time. It's so about gold fields. Huge miner, eight mines around the world. Uh, do about two million ounces of gold a year. And they also have a huge amount of resources and copper as well. They're a huge organization. And we've been very lucky that we've been working with them for about 12 months now. 
Uh, in 2016, um, Granny Smith at Schofield uh, Mine in Western Australia deployed an LTE solution uh, with Challenge Networks. Uh, that's two macro cells, and one macro cell covers all the operational pits. And then if you go to Western Australia, you'd have sites which would have oh, two, three hundred trailers, a bit similar to what you had yesterday. Um, and they've got it down to several sites in LTE. I mean, that's the big advantage above ground. It also basically gives you a much better throughput, latency control, etc. Um, and that's why basically uh, they chose that and they use it for the basic telemetry SCADA. Uh, so you've got the internet and the data communications. They've actually linked it with the analog two way radio for a bridge as well. So you can talk from a smart device to a two way radio. So for the last two years, they've been thinking how they can actually move that and move that underground. Um, so what we've done is we've deployed about three and a half kilometers of leaky feeder of our solution. I think it's about 20 BDAs in there as well. Uh, what it, we, the target was to have a seamless integration of the above ground and below ground operations. So all the features you had above ground you could take underground. You didn't need a different system, didn't need different devices. Um, and then what we're moving towards is phase two deployment. Now phase two will be all the mines in Australia. It'll be between 100 and 200 kilometers underground. And we've got about another 20 to 30 kilometers to do by the end of this year. Um, we did use band three. Band three in LTE is 1.8 gigs. Uh, previously we've used sub one gig technologies, uh, 700 megs, band 28. And there are a lot of different issues you have when you start dealing with 1.8 gigs compared to 700 megs. And we also integrated the VHF to a radio system on there as well. Uh, what we do is a BDS spacing of 150 meters underground on a leaky feeder. And you know the lower frequency bands we can get up to 200 meters. So the highlights out of this network, we have uh, 60 megs down, 40 megs up, and that's pretty consistent all the way through. Um, it's an aggregate, uh, sometimes you get a little bit less in spots just because of the local environment. Uh, it is very difficult to try and deploy LTE uh, solutions, but it gives you as good as Wi-Fi, uh, a better throughput and a more consistent real-time throughput. We do have good coverage until the open stops. We have high powered antennas for about 50 meters away, so you can run your remote boggers into the remote stops. Uh, it works very well. The actual core itself, we, we've, uh, well, challenge of you Cisco cores. Uh, they also use Nokia uh, Ramsey core, which is the no bees, the Pico cells, you know, the access points, basically. And then our BDS solution. Also, our BDAs, we have a Bluetooth BLE device, so it's easy for we can do zonal tracking. And what we did find, we had to put on uh, 1.8 gigs, an extra bit of signal conditioner, which makes the throughput really resilient. So we get very variations in throughput, you know, maybe two or three times difference on your spots. And it could be in this room, you could do different speed tests, you could get a different result. Uh, with that little box, basically, it makes it pretty resilient all the way through. So the challenges of trying to do LTE underground. It's very hard to propagate a signal underground. Same as indoors. It's extremely difficult to do. And that's in Wi-Fi, that's in LTE, in any kind of wireless technology or radio technology. Um, a couple of years ago, when Challenge Networks looked at this problem uh, with the mine, nobody really had an idea what the best way of going. So different vendors were trying different approaches. Uh, there was a vendor in Australia that basically uh, had a big 21 E B with a, a big uh, antenna, with a big gain, 10 dB gain antenna, and they pointed it down the portal thinking that would be a solution. So really they were radiating 200 watts above somebody's head, which is not a good thing to do. Uh, not the fact that there's also a global standard saying 8 watts is the maximum you should do underground when you're radiating in anything which is explosive. And metals in powder form usually explode. Uh, so that didn't work too well. And uh, they also then tried to mimic what we do with Wi Fi, so every 100 meters, the best they put a big cell. So. Incredibly expensive. And in some of the solutions that we're talking $150,000, $250,000 a kilometer. So extremely expensive to do. Uh, the other approach was uh, either to do like an indoor DAS. Uh, which basically you'd have a, a cable and you'd have antennas spaced out every 50 or so meters. And there are some deployments like that. And that's how you do your skyscrapers now. The problems you have with there is that you've got to really tune your antennas and also for the gain, because what you, you don't actually want high power, you want low power. You want just to give them enough coverage so you get the fruit pulp, but you don't get the reflections. And then leaky feeder. And if you go into a traffic tunnel, you'll find leaky feeders which have uh, sorry, which are in traffic tunnels, sorry, you'll have leaky feeders, which are seven, eight, one and a half inch cables all the way along. And that's how you use your mobile usually in traffic tunnels or train tunnels. So there was a whole mixture. How could they actually do this? What was the best option? Um, we've been working on the leaky feeder solution over the half inch cable. 
for four years now, and basically the last two years it's been in test and refinement with our partners. So what you're looking for is uh, when you're trying to deploy something underground, you've got to do it fairly quickly. You can't spend six months modeling. Um, if you do the indoor dust solutions, you know, bees, Pico cells, uh, we've had mines we've done with other partners where they try to use that approach and they've given up after several months. It's just too complex to try and get the modeling done. And so what you're looking at is the best trade-off between price, performance, installation, support. You know, you want to make it as simple as possible to install. It's crucial that it's, it's easy to install by the guys who are on site when they want to extend it. Uh, and again, the local challenge we had here was we had band three. Uh, LTE, in parts of the world, you can do what you want underground. In certain countries, the telcos own the frequency bands. In Australia, the telcos own it, but you can get band three, band one, so we could use 1.8 or 2 gigs underground. So this is what the, uh, it looks like. So we have above ground, we have the Cisco data center, and that's the Cisco core, so that's where you set your users up, set your rules for your, uh, for your network. It's also got a speed server. Uh, one of the mistakes we made early on is when you do a speed test. Usually people just download an application on the phone, uh, and then they do a down and up, and all of a sudden that's what they think it is. But what they'll notice the data center, the speed test data center, could be 200 kilometers away, so it's not just the mines. Uh, speed you're looking at, it's actually the, the speed, not, sorry, not just the LTE speed you're looking at, you're looking at the external speed of the mine to the far point. And you get people who come back with three, 400 kilobits thinking it's a really good LTE solution when really the actual LTE would be tens of 20 megs. Uh, so then you have a fibre which goes to the Eno B there, it's actually a mini cell, five watts we use, which we tune down to about 250 milliwatts, it's very low power. Uh, what you do for the leaky feeder system, and then that feeds in to the uh, controller. Now, there will be about seven of these underground, which will give us about 40 kilometers of coverage. So that gets into the BDA system. Uh, the big grey box there is the controller. That's where you insert your VHF cable and you combine that with your LTE, E no B. It also, you inject the power there as well, so it's got two DC inputs. Uh, 48 volts is what our preferred one is. It's also got an embedded PC, so that's what we use for monitoring. So we do SNMP, but we're also just doing Modbus now to integrate some SCADA systems. Then you have an end connector, then you get a yellow leaky feeder cable. Now, uh, yellow leaky feeder cable, it's a, a, a coaxial cable with holes in the outer conductor, which means the signal radiates. It just leaks signal all the way around. It's very good for long distances. It's very good if you want to go around corners and down declines. Uh, laterally, you may get 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 metres of coverage, whatever you design it to. Uh, so it's very good for tunnels. It's very good for underground mines. And it's been used for two radio systems for you know, 15, 20 years now. So every 150 metres, we put one of our VDS. Uh, that's got two cards. It's got a two-way radio card, which amplifies. And it's also got a LTE card. Now, the LTE bands we use are called FDD. Um, basically, that means you have two separate um, parts of the spectrum for transmitting and receiving. So you're not, you're not trying to do the same with time division. You're actually able to then to propagate and keep amplifying one band down and a separate band back up. So there's no time delay in that. And the actual, the actual BDA delays it by about 330 nanoseconds. So it's almost the speed of light. So it allows you to go uh, significant distances. And again, when you want to split, you just put the splitter in there. I say in the BDA, we have a couple of Bluetooth devices. One's for zonal tracking. So you can get underneath it with a, a, a BLE reader. And that'll put, uh, give you a location back. We also have a, another one where you can do the local settings for that BDA as well. So that's what the network looks like now. So if you look at the far side, there's the yellow E node B. That's the, an access point in Wi-Fi. So basically one uh, cell is covering about four kilometers of the mine. And this will cover about seven, I think, eventually. Uh, so I think it's between about seven and 10 is the average uh, for each one. So you saw the presentation yesterday with Resolute. They've got an access point every 90 meters. And they've got fiber to each one of those uh, access points. Uh, and then they've also got a pole device, which is about every 1.8 kilometers, they've got a massive GPS to cover that section. With this one, we've got four kilometers of coverage. Every 150 meters, we put an inline BDA, and there's only one other power injector point, which is a 240 watt device. So it's extremely low cost to deploy this solution compared to the alternatives. Uh, at the end of the stalks, we also had eye gain antennas, which is the only time we put any kind of gain in the system. Uh, we are talking. Um, minus 50 dBs kind of level, which is, you know, we're talking picowatts uh, kind of power levels, uh, what you're radiating. It's a very tiny 
uh, amount of power you need to get a, a good signal. You actually don't want a strong signal. Strong signal, you get reflections. So what we're doing here? Yeah, halfway through. Um, best practice when you're installing leaky feeders. Now this is the same for any two-way radio as well as it will be for LTE. Unfortunately, this is completely abused by my sites with two-way radio, which is why after 10 years they complain it's not working very well. It's because they've abused it for 10 years and finally it will fall over. But if you respect a bit of distance, which we say 150 mil, six inches, uh, hang it from the ceiling, from the mesh. Uh, it's very simple to deploy, very quick, very easy. Uh, if you want to put it uh, off the side mesh on the wall, uh, we did design a spacer, but we found just a concrete farmer's was the simplest way of doing it. You just use a cable tie, tie it to the mesh, and then put the cable, give that separation. And also we use end connectors, which we use a preformed cable. So we actually have the preformed cable made or challenge do. Uh, and this, so it's a very quick way of deploying. You just screw it into a VDA. And again, like I said, we have a spice model for the power as well. Yeah, so you've got loss of power underground, so you don't have to particularly have to put a, a particular power point in there for the network. You can just usually pinch it from an existing power source. And you do do a quick test. Uh, that's a network analyzer. That's about $4,000 piece of equipment. It's not a forty or $50,000 piece of equipment. And that's a distance of fault test. And 150 meters is a spike. That means that's the end of the cable. As long as that's flat line, everything's fine. You know, and this one we came to commission on the site, uh, about 25 metres, uh, there was a big issue. And that's where they fed the cable uh, uh, on top of a vent. And every time the vent blew air, it just banged it against the roof. So eventually the outer conductor broke. It still had LTE throughput and two air radio throughput. It just basically cost 15 dB of signal. So why do we make these rules? Why do we say you have to install it this way? This is about 20 minutes normally, but I will uh, be uh, very brief. Um, if you, a leaky feeder is an antenna, and if you have a, a TV antenna, you won't put a spanner on top of it, or a, a bar. What they do underground, they tie a leaky feeder to a mesh or to plates or whatever, they're just grounding it uh, constantly. At low frequencies you can get away, at high frequencies you can't. LTE, like Wi-Fi, um, needs basically uh, a decent signal to noise ratio. And if you clamp it against uh, a mesh, you probably cost you 10 or 15 Bs of your signal to noise ratio. Uh, through there's a lot of Fs and uh, with all the different issues. And F is probably the biggest issue you've got when you actually deploy it wrong, when it becomes problems. The one at the bottom, passive intermodulation. Um, this is more relevant for high power devices. We, I say we basically do zero dB, which is a milliwatt we start. And it goes down to about minus 100 milliwatts by the, sorry, minus 100 dBm by the time the signal is still good off the cable. Uh, passive intermodulation, example above ground. Um, I read the other week there was a North American telco that rebuilt a tower three times, they couldn't get the fruit book. And they found that a mile and a half away, there was just an antenna pointing back out the, uh, back out the tower. And that was enough to crunch the fruit book significantly. So we say underground, just respect 150 mil, and that's what you'll get your best results for. I don't expect a mile and a half. So why do we say this, and what, you know, what mistakes have we made in the past? And 90% of the mistakes are cable related. So what we usually say is do a, uh, an area, one or two kilometers, test the system, uh, and then we'll come in. These are the rules, what we want to install to. The problem is you've got a lot of RF guys who looked after the leaky feeder, and probably the mistake we made, uh, we sold it as LTE and two-way radio, when we should have said LTE, plus you can have two-way radio on top. So it's just the, the way of positioning it. So they, they saw it as an extension of the two-way radio system and not as a, it can support two-way. So they installed it the same way as they would a two-way radio system. So that's a 1,000 volt cable that is basically tucked under. Massive electrical interference, noise into it. Um, you know, it's quite crazy how they install it some, uh, sometimes underground. We said try and respect 10 metres, sorry, 10 metres between BDAs. There's about half a metre there, so you get a lot of feedback in between the two. And what that did, that crunched the throughput by about 50% on one of the legs. Uh, this is actually a VHF BDA. So two years ago, our first deployment, 700 megs. We were going to use the existing cable, because you can use 700 megs, you can use the Brady cable. There's going to be a cheap way of uh, basically implementing the system. And we went down to have a look under, underground, and it came with the two way radio. The blast had failed for the second day running, and they used the leaky feeder for the blast. They have major issues with the leaky feeder system. 
And with that one, actually the workmanship for actually installing is quite hard. They made a nice pretzel, they tucked it behind an electrical cable, they tied it to a mesh. RF-wise, it's completely wrong. You couldn't have done anything worse. And what that does is the BDA increases the power. It just feeds it back into the input. Uh, the automatic gain control kept going up and down, kept oscillating. So the mined comms would be up, down, up, down, up, down. And, and that had been going on for quite some time. So we spent the first two days trying to fix up their existing VHF system. And the final practice that people do is they call cables. You're not supposed to call cables. Droop them, snake them, don't coil them. VHF, UHF, you get away. Um, but 1.8 gigs, you will not get away with it. And that actually was 75% cost in throughput. When we undid that, it went fourfold increase in throughput. So again, if you, you know, respect the cable, uh, inspect the installation practice, it'll work. The biggest issue we had, uh, we had a, a Chinese uh, provider, which actually provided a very high quality cable. They provide all the telcos in China. And what they do, they do two kilometer runs, test it, got good performance, but then they took it to a third party to get the terminations done. And what they did, they used an electrical drill to drill the uh, end of the cables to terminate it, and then they put the end connectors on. So the one on the far side is what they do with an electrical drill, is burrs. Get away with that at low frequencies, at high frequencies, it costs six, seven dBs again. So you lost a quarter of your gain just from the connector. It also caused a lot of reflections back in. So the energy's got to go somewhere. If you go on the right, when you do need to do uh, a termination, just use a proper tool, and then all of a sudden you're down to less than a dB of loss. It's a much more efficient way of doing it. The other way is how you test. Um, we started off, every has a smartphone, they download an app, they do speed testing. We've already talked about the server. But what we found, one of them's a cat phone, one's a Sony phone. Uh, the actual Sony phone has actually got all the right software on for testing, but the throughput was a third less, and it's purely because of the antenna in the phone. So really what you want to do is try and test uh, to the actual the same type of equipment you're using. And it's the antennas on the endpoints which are important. So if you want big throughput and you're going to do it for your remote miners, your bogus, really you should be using a modem uh, for your, an LTE modem, which has usually got a couple of antennas on, and use that for your testing, because that's what you use in real life. Uh, so again, and what you do, you, test, you do spot tests, then you do the aggregate throughput as well testing. And you test you use about every 30 meters, you do a spot test as well. So here we are, next steps. Um, we've done 20 megs. Uh, the actual BD itself can do uh, wider channels, so they're going to put an 80 meg channel in there. That'll give you more throughput if you need it, but to be completely honest, they've got already more than what they need already. We're going to start category 1M, the IoT trials, and that will give you huge amounts of data for Max to play with and other people. Um, push to talk over LTE, people keep saying LTE push to talk is going to take over two way radios, not for the next 10 years. Uh, two way radios, it's instant communication, plus if all your network goes down, you've still got simplex, you can still basically propagate that signal and talk, you know, several hundred metres underground. You can't do that with LTE, even with the latest standards. Uh, we're starting to move uh, from remote control also into autonomous or semi autonomous, like it was yesterday. Again, really, if you want to do autonomous, they need a latency of well under 100 milliseconds. You can only guarantee that with LTE. You can't guarantee that with Wi-Fi. You know, as soon as you get collisions in Wi-Fi, it retries, it stuffs it up. In LTE, it's collision-free. You can guarantee your latency figures. Whatever you get is what you get. And then people starting what we talked about uh, this morning. You know, people are talking about augmented, trying different trials. I mean, Microsoft's got a really nice pair of glasses, uh, second section coming out, which are good. Uh, we're also starting to see virtual reality uh, start to come in. So you see what's going on underground, a lot of training, etc. Uh, and even uh, one of the applications is like a Google Maps underground, where you'll go every 10, 15 metres, you'll jump, and then you'll be able to see your picture underground. And the idea is uh, what they're trying to do is they're, they're going to have a couple of cameras on vehicles, so that'll be three days old. So there's an issue underground. Rather than spending four hours to travel 20 kilometres underground, which it does take, and, 20, and four hours to get back up, um, you can actually just uh, flick through and see this is what it looked like two days ago. So I can see what the issues are. So there's a huge amount that's coming along which big data gives you. So in summary, uh, we deployed so far three and a half kilometres, which gives us about four kilometres of coverage with the antennas. Uh, we're going to extend the rest of the mines in Australia. This will be between 100 and 200 kilometres in the next 12 months. Uh, we do have seamless integration for services above and below ground. It works very well. Uh, we have managed to implement band-free LTE, so it is 1.8 gigs, uh, and VHF on the same cable. The throughput, the maximum was 60 down, 40 up, and that's a true throughput compared uh, to Wi-Fi. It is collision-free, so you do get really good throughput. Again, certain spots it will be a bit lower, but overall aggregate, that's what you get. 
And we do get good coverage in the open store, so the remote bogging, you know, they can extra three or four scoops out of where they had before. And we do do the Bluetooth. So I managed to do that in 26 minutes. So that was the quick version. Um, also, I've got, I've got Jack here from Challenge, so any LT specific ones, I'm going to flick it to him. Any propagation issues, I can answer. So questions, please.